Uh, it looks like it's 1 p.m. So uh, welcome everyone to uh, Drisha's uh, spring program. And this is the second class in this uh, four class series on suffering and prosperity, a Jewish philosophical uh, exploration. We value everyone's active participation. So if you are able to uh, turn on your video, that would be really uh, great to be able to see each other. Um, please feel free to ask questions uh, during class, uh, either by unmuting yourself or by putting questions in the chat box uh, here on Zoom or um, as a comment on uh, Facebook if you're watching us live. Uh, you can also use it if you'd like to raise your hand, uh, you could use um, uh, on Zoom, there's a way to uh, uh, raise your hand so we can call on you. Um, in today's lecture, we will turn to a number of proposed solutions to the problems of evil that place human beings in the center of the cosmos and creation. The so-called free will at theodicy and soul making theodicies, we will explore their philosophical uh, cogency and their fit with the Jewish tradition. And with that, I'll turn this to uh, Dr. Siegel. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and welcome back uh, to those who were here last week uh, and to those who weren't uh, here last week, uh, welcome. Um, okay, so uh, as promised last time, um, and as uh, Evie said, uh, we're gonna spend today's lecture and next week's lecture uh, looking at um, some proposed solutions uh, to the problem or problems uh, of evil. As we noted last time, there are a number of problems that need to be addressed. And so we'll uh, look at solutions um, that, that try to uh, address at least one, uh, if not more of them. Um, and the, the ones that we're gonna look at tonight, um, sorry, today for uh, many of you, um, uh, are uh, solutions that share something substantive in common, um, and that is, that they place humanity uh, at the center, at least uh, they're centrally enough, we are central enough uh, in the cosmos that uh, God sort of planned creation uh, and allowed for evil uh, in creation um, because of us, right? That's what they share uh, uh, in common, the ones we're gonna look at uh, tonight and today, and, and uh, that's gonna make them different from the ones uh, we see next week. But if there's gonna be any solution at all, um, it's going to have to have a certain shape. There's going to have to be a certain uh, assumption in the background. So I want to uh, put that out as a, a preliminary, and this is a preliminary both to today's discussion and uh, to next week's discussion. Um, so even though we said uh, last week uh, that we are going to just presuppose uh, that it's not the case, there's some uh, fundamental, uh, equally powerful uh, evil force Right, that would be, uh, in a way, a solution. We'd be a solution by giving up one of the main planks. Um, so we're not going to assume that there's that kind of constraint on, on God. I mean, we're going to assume that the sole fundamental reality is God, and uh, God is uh, perfectly good. But uh, if there's going to be any solution at all, it seems like we're going to have to assume that there are some constraints on God, right? at least some logical constraints. Uh, on what God can do. That is, it's not true um, that God can do just anything, okay? If we say, uh, you know, if I, if I put forward some sort of situation or state of affairs, it doesn't automatically follow from God's being God and being almighty and omnipotent that he can bring that uh, situation into being, right? There might be certain situations that are just intrinsically impossible, and so God can't bring them uh, about. No being uh, could bring them about. And it's not, it's not a defect uh, in God. It's not a, a limitation on his omnipotence because these things are just not even uh, logically possible. Right? Now, why do I say that uh, pretty much any proposal, any solution uh, is going to have to assume that? Um, well, uh, I see there are already questions in the chat. Um, uh, what they're, I think there are at least two reasons uh, that uh, that's going to be the case. Okay, and it, it's an interesting philosophical question: how far you can get uh, in proposing solutions without assuming it. But here are two reasons uh, to think that you can't get very far; that you won't be able to propose a solution. One is that the sort of the form of every solution that we're going to see, and the form of every possible solution, uh, it seems, is going to be something like 
God is justified in permitting evil or in permitting this evil in order to, and then you fill in the blank. And the question, the difference between the different proposals is going to be in how you fill in uh, that blank. But that's only going to be a justification that which fills in the blank. If he couldn't have achieved whatever end that was, right, without permitting the evil, because if he could have achieved it, whatever we're going to say, the end is that uh, God was was trying to achieve. Um, well, then it wouldn't really be an excuse. It wouldn't be a justification. He could have just done without the evil and still uh, obtain that same result, right? So that means there has to be things that he couldn't, he just couldn't have achieved uh, without um, something being the case. But that means there are things that even God can't do. There are limits on, on God's power. And another way to see it, maybe more um, uh, tricky, um, uh, but uh, uh, illuminating maybe in its own way is that uh, if there's any contradiction that God could have made true. So suppose we're thinking that God's power is absolutely unlimited. He could have made it the case for, you know, some claim or other that it's true and also not true. Right? So he could have made it the case that I exist, our own exists, and it's not the case that our own exists. Okay, that's an outright contradiction. Um, but if we assume that God has absolutely unlimited power, he's not even limited by the laws of logic, um, then presumably there's going to be some contradiction like that that he could make true. But on standard assumptions about logic, if that's the case, then he could have made any contradiction true. And if that's the case, then whatever answer we give, whatever proposal we would give, right? God could have made it the case that there is evil and also that there isn't evil. So even if we give a very interesting um, uh, proposal, which explains why it is that God allowed evil or allowed um, some evil or other, that would only explain why it is that there is evil. But it wouldn't explain why God didn't make it the case that there is evil. And in this crazy contradictory way, that there also isn't evil. Right? Because after all, the latter thing is not true. It's just not true that there is no evil. Okay, so in a nutshell, those are two reasons to think that there's going to have to be some sort of limit uh, on God, God's power, let's say a logical limit, if there's going to be um, any hope of a solution at all. And the, the truth is, that is certainly the dominant view among contemporary philosophers, among philosophers historically, and among Jewish thinkers historically. Okay, so uh, I brought a passage from the Guide of the Perplexed. From Maimonides, where he makes this point emphatically, and he even claims that no thinking man denies the truth of this maxim, okay, that there are certain things that are just impossible, and if they're impossible, period, then they're impossible even uh, for God. It's true that most thinking people uh, did not deny this, and most of the uh, Jewish thinkers throughout history and Jewish philosophers concurred with um, Maimonides on this score, there are outliers, though. Um, so especially among uh, Hasidic thinkers, you do find uh, exceptions uh, to this consensus. You find those who claim that God could literally do anything. That is, even make a contradiction true. He could make something be both a square and a triangle at the very same time. But he can make two plus two equals five. It's absolutely unlimited. Okay, um, on the... Uh, uh, non-Jewish philosophical side, most famous in this regard is Descartes, who seems to uh, endorse this position, Rene Descartes, um, uh, who inaugurated modern philosophy. Um, but uh, he was sort of um, uh, alone in that regard. And so too on the Jewish side, uh, it's, it's not very common to find. Like I said, among Hasidic thinkers who have it, here is a passage from Rav Nachman of Breslov, uh, um, who is directly addressing Maimonides in his Guide of the Perplexed and, say, and he quotes him and says, uh, or he's quoted as saying, I believe the Holy, blessed, Holy One, blessed be he, could make the triangle a square for the ways of Hashem are hidden from us and he is almighty and nothing is beyond him. Okay, so he explicitly takes issue with Maimonides on this score and thinks that there are no limits, no logical limits even 
to God's power. And if that's the case, there's very little hope of there being a, um, a theodicy, which might explain why um, Rav Nachman, uh, I think, despaired of finding uh, a theodicy. He uh, thought the very question itself uh, was uh, a question that sort of bring one, brings one to the void. It emerges from the void, as he says, and uh, pondering it brings you to the void. Doesn't seem to think that there is a, a solution um, to this problem, that there are the many problems of evil uh, that fits uh, perfectly well uh, with his position here, because no uh, no solution could be uh, could be stated um, or be true. Sorry, uh, if his uh, if he's right that God could have made absolutely anything the case. Okay, so we're going to assume for the most part, uh, or uh, we're going to assume for the rest of these uh, two lectures today's and and next weeks when we're discussing proposed solutions that Maimonides uh, and uh, those who agree with him are correct, okay, and that there are going to be limits, at least the truths of logic um, impose limits even on God, okay, but it's important to keep in mind that yes, that, you know, that concession is being made, but Jewish thinkers and we should be hesitant to concede much more than that, so yes, we might grant that um, logical truths are uh, beyond God's ability to, to change, um, to undo, but we're not going to want to, um, you know, include certain truths about, let's say, human psychology, contingent truths, or truths that appear to be contingent, could have been otherwise, right? Those are going to be things that uh, God could have made otherwise, okay? And so we always, we should always be uh, on the, uh, on guard, so to speak, um, when confronting a theodicy, I just heard that. Thank you. Uh, uh, an answer uh, to the the problem of evil, we should always ask ourselves: Well, does it satisfy this constraint that it doesn't assume any further limitations on God than the absolute necessity, right? The things that just couldn't have been otherwise, like the truths of logic and mathematics. Um, if it assumes further limitations, then that would be a problem with the proposal. As we're gonna see shortly, I think that's a, a significant problem with uh, one of the proposals, okay, one of the main proposals. Okay, so let's uh, now begin looking at the proposals, unless there are any questions on that. Uh, any, any questions? Uh, yes, if I may. Sure. Um, could we combine sort of different different metaphors is it possible to assume, I mean, it's possible, but does it make sense to assume that, um, that God uh, shrunk himself, you know, it seems to, a, into um, patterns of logic, that once, he, once God developed logic, uh, God decided to uh, uh, shrink himself into following logic. So it's not that he couldn't do otherwise, but that for logic to make sense, and and uh, uh, yeah, for logic to make sense and and sort of gain credibility for God's intellectual creations, uh, God made him made it impossible that he couldn't contradict logic. Right. So um, yeah, that's an excellent question, um, and that kind of view may actually be the view that Descartes held. Um, the philosopher I mentioned earlier, um, and, and some Jewish thinkers and uh, more generally uh, religious thinkers suggest something like that uh, when it comes to the, the problem of evil. So they say something very much along the lines that you're saying, that you don't really need to assume that God is constrained by logic. You just have to assume that God chose uh, to be right. so constrained by logic. But the, the question then can be pushed further, but right? if that's uh, what one says, um, but why did he need to constrain himself in that way? Like what, what did he um, uh, do that for? And then, you know, there could be all sorts of answers. Like it sounded like you were uh, suggesting that he needed to do that so that we creatures sort of um, give logic credibility. Right. But then we, th we then asked the follow-up question, right? Well, could he have achieved that aim of his without constricting himself? And if so, he didn't need to constrict himself, or 
Could he not have achieved that aim without constricting himself? And now we're back to assuming that there's something that's impossible, right? something that he couldn't have done. He couldn't have simultaneously achieved whatever aim, whatever aim it is he hoped to achieve by so constricting himself and not constricting himself. Right? So it seems to me that that just pushes the question back um, you know, as interesting a suggestion as it is, and it may, it may well be true, um, but in terms of uh, making it possible to give a theodicy, it seems like it, it uh, doesn't allow, ultimately, for the giving of an answer to the, the problems of evil. Okay, but yeah, very good question. Okay, so now, uh, if there are no other questions about that, let's move on uh, to- I think uh, 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 Chaya has a question, oh, right? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Chaya, go ahead and unmute. Oh, oh yes, okay, now I see. Hi, sorry. Hi. Um, sorry, just in what you just said just now, um, yeah. wouldn't that kind of basically present a problem for any time God does anything? Because God, if God's omnipotent, God could have done it in a better way. And like any time we talk about God making a compromise or really even something that doesn't feature a compromise, like it just feels like a bit of like a logical like word game almost. Like anytime God does anything, God could have done it better because God could do anything, which includes better than what he did. So isn't that kind of just like a theological problem with God doing anything? I don't know if I'm making sense, but- No, you're making a lot of sense. And that's a, it's a fantastic question. Um, it uh, raises a number of questions um, pertaining to uh, Leibniz's answer to uh, the problem of evil, which you may have uh, heard some of you. Right? Leibniz's view is that we live in the, the best possible world. Okay, so there's more to say about the answer and he develops it more, but he does assume as part of his answer that there is a best possible world uh, and this is it. Right? And he, he was famously ridiculed by um, Voltaire um, for claiming that this is uh, the best of all possible worlds. But um, it seems to me that uh, it's hard to, to ridicule someone for that. I mean, this is stuff that may be well beyond our ken, maybe this is the best of all possible worlds, maybe it isn't, it's very hard to know. Um, so putting it out there as a suggestion doesn't seem to be uh, ludicrous. Now, if he's right, um, and this is the best of all possible worlds, then the answer to your question, why God didn't do better, is that he couldn't have done any better, right? So then, so then you have necessity constraining God, right, in the way that um, we're, we were just saying that we're going to assume that God is constrained by what's intrinsically impossible. So if this is just the best there could possibly be, uh, then it's no it's no complaint of any sort right? the guy could have done better because he, he couldn't have done better um, if there's nothing better to do. Um, if this isn't the best of all possible worlds, um, uh, the complaint might get off the ground depending on a number of things, one of which is whether there is a best possible world at all, right? So you might think for any possible world, you can make it better. I think that's what you were assuming. You know, you can just add some good things somewhere, you know, add another pocket uh, where some really good things are going on and you thereby make the world even better. Okay, if that's true, it means there isn't any best possible world. It's like, you know, someone saying, what's the highest number? There, there is no highest number. For every number, there's a higher one. This would be the same kind of thing. For every uh, possible world, there would be a better one, right? And so then, while it's true that God could have done better, no matter what he did, he could have done better, it might also be true that you can't really complain about that, okay? As long as he got to some sort of minimal threshold of goodness, uh, you can't fault God for not creating the best possible world because, not because he did in this case, but because there isn't any best possible world. And now again, this is a necessity, right? It's just a necessary truth. If it's true that there's no best possible world, uh, that there isn't any best possible world, God was bound by that just like um, anyone else would be bound by that. And so again, you'd have something of a solution, even if God could have done better, but as long as he always could have done better, uh, there'd be nothing um, to criticize God for. Okay, but this gets us into pretty deep waters and. Uh, um, you know, we can talk about this uh, after, uh, if you'd like, I wasn't planning on talking much about uh, Leibniz and the issue of the best possible world. Maybe we'll revisit this when we talk next week about the, the multiverse. All right. Um, okay, so now if there are, are no questions, let's, uh, let's jump into 
the first theodicy, um, a theodicy that, like I said, assumes uh, that human beings have a, uh, a central role and a central place in the cosmos and in creation, so central that it actually shaped how God created the world, what he chose uh, to do, sort of the arena that he chose to make, and that the evils uh, that he allowed. Okay, and this is uh, the first one we're going to look at is what's called a soul-making theodicy. It's the first one we're going to look at because I think it's sort of um, uh, uh, expressing a very common notion or thought immediately that someone has um, when, when thinking about the problem of evil, um, which is to think that some amount of suffering and adversity is essential to, you know, proper normal moral development, right? To dealing with adversity, exhibiting courage, uh, showing devotion and love. These are all things that come to the fore when there is suffering, whether, whether it's the person himself who's suffering or uh, when he's coming to the aid uh, of someone else who's suffering, okay? And that I think is a very common thought sort of that immediately leaps to mind. And uh, some philosophers try to make this into a full-blown theodicy, uh, a word that we keep on using, right? A defense of God. Um, this doesn't mean necessarily that we, we think we know uh, that this is God's reason, right? It means if we're putting it forward in this sort of tentative way, which many of the philosophers do, um, we're putting it forward as Something that's true for all we know. Maybe this is what's going on. Maybe this is the explanation. Okay. Um, and so uh, the philosopher, the contemporary philosopher um, who pushed this line um, most uh, effectively uh, and consistently was John Hick. Okay. Uh, in his book, Evil and the God of Love, which is very uh, interesting uh, historical treatment, historical, theological, and philosophical treatment of the problem. And in uh, the second half of the book, he turns to his preferred solution, in which he says, I suggest that it is an ethically reasonable judgment, even though in the nature of the case, not one that is capable of demonstrative proof, that human goodness slowly built up through personal histories of moral effort as a value in the eyes of the creator, which justifies even the long travail of the soul-making process. Okay, and so that's, uh, he says, um, why we should expect that this is not a world pure, a pure pleasure in the absence of pain, it is rather a place of soul making, as he says in the next piece, if then there's any true analogy between God's purpose for his human creatures and the purpose of loving and wise parents for their children. So he builds heavily on an analogy between the divine human relationship and the parent parent child relationship. If that we take that seriously, he says, we have to recognize that the presence of pleasure and the absence of pain cannot be the supreme and overriding end for which the world exists. Rather, this world must be a place for soul making. And its value is to be judged, not primarily by the quantity of pleasure and pain occurring in it at any particular moment, but by its fitness for its primary purpose, the purpose of uh, soul making, okay, which she takes from a letter, Veil of Soul Making, takes from a letter from Keats. Um, <clears throat> so that's in, in a nutshell, okay, what the soul making uh, theodicy says. It says that there has to be, God created the world in a sort of uh, imperfect state where there's going to invariably be suffering and pain and adversity because otherwise there'd be no room for soul making. There'd be no room for this kind of uh, moral development. Okay, And so God had, in order to allow for the uh, moral development, in order to allow for the soul making, God had to uh, put us in this situation in which there were imperfections and pain and suffering so that human beings could uh, hopefully um, respond appropriately and in a way that develop themselves morally. Okay, now in a second, uh, we're gonna turn to some Midrashic sources that sort of um, uh, resonate with this. Maybe um, uh, some of them are familiar, uh, maybe they uh, spring to mind, um, but just in the way he's formulated it in this passage, we should already note that there is, I think a, at least a prima facie difficulty, right? Um, which is that, remember, God is limited if he is 
only by sort of the absolute necessities, things like logic, mathematics, um, but not the truths of human psychology. So if God could have made human character but in such a way that we would develop in the preferred direction, again, even if you think there's a value in developing, but say we could, God could have created us so that we naturally develop in this way, even without the prodding of evil and adversity and suffering, but then it seems like that prod, then that arena is again gratuitous. It's not necessary. God didn't have to put us in this place. He could have just made us very differently. It's true that given the way he's made us, he's going to also have to put us in, uh, in this place of soul making, which includes evil. But if he had made us differently, maybe he could have achieved this, this aim of creating beings who develop morally and develop morally due to their own uh, uh, personal histories, even of moral effort, but without having, to having had to respond to evil, suffering, and pain. That's a prima facie difficulty, which um, we're, I, I'm going to want to revisit um, shortly when we get to some of the Jewish sources, which is what we're going to do right now. Okay, we're going to turn to some of the Jewish sources that maybe um, spring to mind uh, for some of us when we hear this approach from John Hick. Okay, um, so one thing that uh, that leaps to my mind is a midrash on last week's uh, Torah reading, the midrash Tanhuma, and the reading of Tazria, where the midrash is discussing uh, the the mitzvah of circumcision, um, and it brings a debate between Rabbi Akiva and Turnus Rufus, who is a, uh, an interlocutor of Rabbi Akiva in many locations, as we'll see shortly, another um, passage in which they have a dispute. And they're, they're, they're very often uh, at odds with one another on theological and philosophical grounds. And here is one of the cases where Turnus Rufus asks Rabbi Akiva, whose things are better, uh, you know, God's creations or human creations? And Rabbi Akiva, perhaps surprisingly, says human creations. And then reveals to us, the Midrash reveals to us that Rabbi Kiva sort of wanted to preempt the next question. He knew where Turner's Rufus was going uh, with this, right? Because um, Turner's Rufus asked, well, why do you circumcise? Right? Why don't you just leave things uh, as God made them? And Rabbi Kiva says, aha, I got you. And I anticipated your question. The works of man are more beautiful than the ones of the Holy, um, Holy One, blessed be he. Okay, so we are, in a sense, improving reality. We're improving the creation that God gave us. But it seems like Turner's Rufus also anticipated the Akiva and maybe set him up. Um, because then he asked the follow-up question, which is, well, okay, that's, you know, you can say that. You can say that our works are more beautiful. But you, Rabbi Akiva, presumably agree that God could have done it this way, right? He he could have done anything. He could have made us so that um, uh, all human males were born already circumcised. Why didn't he do that? And so Rabbi Kiva answers him. This is uh, uh, a wonderful passage. Rabbi Kiva said to him, uh, and why does his umbilical cord uh, come out on him? Does not his mother cut his umbilical cord? So why does he not not come out circumcised because the Holy One, blessed be He, only gave Israel the commandments in order to purify them. Therefore, David said, "The word of the Lord is pure." Like in Hebrew, um, that God gave the commandments with saref bahen, saref bahen et abriot, as it appears in another midrash. Now, it's very important to note that here we have not just a theology of mitzvot. This is a theology of mitzvot that became very famous through the work of Nachmanides. Okay, Nachmanides um, adopted this as maybe his primary explanation for why God gave mitzvot at all. Why did he give us commandments? Uh, and his answer is, it's in order to shape and form humanity right, in, a, in a positive direction. But here we have this, not just as a theology of mitzvot, in this midrash, it serves also as a theology of creation. It right, is an explanation of why creation is the way it is, why it is defective or not fully perfected from the beginning. Right? The answer is because God wanted to give mitzvot 
to human beings in order to perfect them. Right? So if we translate this into Hickeyan terms, it seems very natural to translate it that way. Right? Rabbi Kiva seems to be saying, God put us in a place of soul making. He created the world as a place of soul making precisely because he wanted us to develop in this uh, positive moral and spiritual and religious direction. And so it should be just to be clear, even Hick thinks that the development is not just moral, but also spiritual and religious. Um, and so uh, it's very natural to read this in a, in a Hickian vein. Right? And that would um, be to say that that's why there are these defects. That's why the world is full of evil and suffering and, and other ways in which it's imperfect. And if you read it that way, another passage comes to mind, another passage in which you have Turnus Rufus and Rabbi Akiva having a debate. It's very natural to think of these two passages uh, together, especially if you've given this Hickian interpretation of the first one. And some scholars, there's an article, um, an old article by uh, the late Isidore Tversky, um, in which he just, in passing, seems to assume that you have this very same debate going on in that passage that we've just read. And in this passage that we're about to see, a passage in the Talmud in, in Baba Batra, where here we have a discussion, not of uh, the fact that people are born uncircumcised, but of genuine adversity and suffering. Okay, The fact that there are poor people, right? the suffering of the poor, and here, Rabbi Meir uh, says, the, bright, the Gemara brings a Brayta, which says, Rabbi Meir would say, an opponent of the Torah and of God, maybe, may bring an argument against you and say to you, if your God loves the poor, then for what does he not support them? Right? Why doesn't God feed the poor if he loves them? This is essentially the question, a particular instance of the problem of evil. I mean, you have this suffering uh, human being who's poor and, and needs something, why doesn't God just provide for him? Why doesn't he intervene? So uh, the Gemara says, and here I'm using the English translation, in such a case, say to him, he commands us to act as his agents in sustaining the poor so that through them, we will be credited with the performance of mitzvot and therefore be saved from the judgment of Gehenna. And that's a, a paraphrase. There's a lot added there that's, that's not in the original, but um, it, does, it does seem to do uh, it's not um, uh, too far uh, from, uh, from the meaning of the original, but God entrusts us, empowers us, and specifically doesn't solve the problem himself so that we'll have the opportunity to do so. Now, it does go on to say, right, so that we'll have the opportunity to do so and therefore avoid the judgment of uh, Gehenom, okay, but you know, if we can leave that aside or we can reinterpret or uh, try to understand what the judgment of Ganom uh, is in such a way that it neatly aligns with what we said until now, right? That God is just um, doing this. He's permitting this so as to allow for human moral and religious development, okay? And that seems to also be uh, the upshot, um, again, of what Rabbi Akiva says to Tornus Rufus, in the next piece, okay, so you have this very same statement now being made, not by Rabbi Meir, but by Rabbi Akiva, the very same Rabbi Akiva we had in the previous passage. Okay, here we have, and this is the question that Turnus Rufus, the wicked, asked Rabbi Akiva, the very question, if your God loves the poor, for what reason does he not support them? Sounds off, an awful like, a lot like, why doesn't God just create you circumcised? And Rabbi Akiva said to him, he commands us to sustain the poor so that through them, we will be saved from the judgment of Gehenna, okay? And so he gives an answer, which again, sounds an awful lot like the answer uh, perhaps that he gave in the previous passage that God designed things in this way in order um, to, uh, to improve the, the character of his creatures, okay? So everything would be great. And this parallel, I think, is, is, is really um, quite uh, striking. And we'd have a Hittian soul-making theodicy throughout in the position of Rabbi Kiva, if not for the next paragraph in the uh, Talmudic discussion, okay, where it seems like uh, Rabbi Kiva, at least here, does not endorse a soul-making theodicy. That's not really his explanation of why it is that God uh, 
uh, created a world in which there can be four people. It's not really why God is not intervening um, uh, to prevent this uh, person from being poor. Because they, they, there's been a back and forth between Rabbi Kiva and Turnus, Ruf, Turnus Rufus, in which basically each one is bringing a different parable, okay, to try to make his case that either uh, we shouldn't be intervening to help the poor if this is God's plan, or that we should. And what is Rabbi Akiva's parable? So skip the next paragraph and go to the third one. Rabbi Akiva said to Turnus Rufus, I will illustrate the opposite to you with a different parable. So what is this matter comparable? It is comparable to a king of flesh and blood who was angry with his son and put him in prison and ordered that he should not be fed or given to drink. And one person went ahead and fed him and gave him to drink. If the king heard, right, would he not react by sending that person a gift? And we are called sons. Rabbi Kiva says this is the appropriate parable because we are called sons of God. But now in the parable itself, if we're to ask, why is this person poor? Right? Why is this person poor in the first place? What's the answer, right? If you, if you look at um, uh, the parable in the, in the real world, the case of the poor person, why is the person poor? I mean, according to the parable, the, the king of flesh and blood was angry. He was angry with his son. Apparently the son had done something that warranted this anger. And so he put him in prison, right? And also ordered that um, he should not be fed or given to drink. Now, of course, Rabbi Kiva's point is that despite that fact, despite the fact that God has made the person poor, God is not upset if we step in then and in fact, go ahead and feed the poor. God, in some sense, wants us to violate his uh, stated will, right? He says, no, you're not allowed to eat and drink, but he really deep down wants us to intervene and, and feed the, the poor person. But if you ask yourself, why is the person poor? It's not in order so that we'll have the opportunity to grow and have the opportunity uh, to give this uh, person what he needs. It's apparently because the person is deserving. So that is in this passage, Unfortunately, I'd say, um, we have just a straightforward retributive theodicy. Right? We have the assumption that, you know, in this case, the suffering is because the person did something wrong and is therefore deserving of this. And this is punishment, right? Now, something good comes out of it, but that's not its purpose, okay, according to the, the parable that emerges. And once you see that, then it might lead us to question whether even we, whether we were reading too much. I think, um, into the first passage, because that first passage wasn't really talking about suffering per se. Um, it was talking about the imperfection, right, the defect, um, that defects that there are um, in the world. Okay, um, we are uh, a little short on time, so I'm gonna uh, maybe not do all of these uh, sources, um, but I, I do wanna look now at um, the passage that, although it doesn't use the terminology explicitly, has been interpreted by a number of uh, later religious thinkers as endorsing something uh, like a soul-making theodicy, and maybe one that even has advantages over the version uh, that Hick puts forward. Okay, this is the passage in Brachot 5a. Uh, it's the passage in which you have Yisurin Shel Ahava, afflictions of love. Okay, so if you've heard this term, um, this is the locus classicus. This is where you really have um, the discussion in the Talmud and also in the commentators. Um, on the Talmud, the, the Gemara says as follows, Amar Rava v'yitemer of Chizda, right, Rava and some say of Chizda said, Im adam alav, if a person sees that suffering has befallen him, he should examine his actions, okay? Based on the uh, verse in, in Eicha. Pishpesh below matza, in Lamentations. Pishpesh below matza, let's say he examined his ways and found no transgression. Torah, he should think that it's because not of a, a true transgression, but because he hasn't really fulfilled his potential, that he could have been learning Torah at some point and he didn't. Okay, but what if a person did, does all of that and they can't find anything they've done wrong and they know they've been studying Torah day and night, but then what should he do? And there are such cases of people who suffer. So the Gemara says, they are, it is, known uh, 
he may be confident, according to this translation, that they are afflictions of love. Ki shenemar ki et asher yehav Hashem yochiach. It's the verse in Proverbs that for whom the Lord loves, he, re he rebukes. Okay, and this passage is uh, as uh, interesting as it is uh, enigmatic and pregnant with different possible uh, meanings. Okay, what are these yisurin shel ahava? How are we to understand what these are and in what way do they relate to love? But how are they in some way related to love? So one interpretation, which is, um, uh, you know, I'll just say it at, right now, it's a difficult interpretation and, and Rambam uh, took issue with it, um, criticized it uh, harshly. But this is the one that Rashi, right there um, in that, on that passage, he puts forward, as does Sadyagon, or at least in, in the simple reading of Sadyagon, puts forward the interpretation of Yisurin Shalava, that these are things that God, afflictions that God brings on a person in this world without any transgression at all, any prior transgression, in order to give them a uh, greater reward in the next world, okay? Um, now, you might um, uh, think that problematic for a number of reasons, and I think you'd be right. I think there are a number of problems uh, with this approach. The problem that seems to bother the Rambam in, his, uh, in the guide uh, is that he, he thinks this makes God uh, unjust, right? The, even a human being, um, who uh, is just sort of kind of good, um, you wouldn't think that they would do this, certainly not to someone that they love, but to inflict suffering in order to then, uh, to then bring some, some good to them. I mean, suppose they were only willing to bestow a gift if they could first inflict suffering. I mean, what right do you have to do that? It's not like you're preventing some suffering uh, uh, that would have otherwise occurred. This is like a, an, an added bonus. So who, who are you to decide that you're gonna inflict suffering so that you could then give them uh, this added bonus? Okay, and so um, Rambam uh, really does not like this um, as uh, several other um, philosophers object in the same way. Uh, we'll get back to uh, yet another problem in just a moment after we look at another uh, position, the position, one of the positions that of Yosef Albo, the 15th century Jewish philosopher that we saw last time, actually, in Sefer Ayy Karim, um, he gives a number of interpretations, but one of them uh, is, uh, he says that it's basically, it, right, it's a, a test, a nisayon, but one that is so that others can see that this person who they thought was righteous um, really is serving God out of love. And he's willing to serve God, whether in suffering or in tranquility, right? Which for those who are familiar with the book of Job, um, sounds awfully lot like what's going on uh, in the book of Job, um, right? Uh, the Satan challenges uh, God and says, you know, maybe Job uh, is not truly, um, you know, serving you out of love and he wouldn't do so if he were suffering. And so he puts him through this, Nisayon, what's interesting in, in Albo's suggestion here is that it's for the benefit of others, okay? The whole point, according to Joseph Albo, is that others will see that this person really is righteous, and that's why um, uh, he was prospering, okay? But now this uh, suggestion, along with the suggestion that Rashi made, they both suffer from uh, a different problem, which is the problem I, I noted at the outset. I said we should be, uh, we should, um, be on guard uh, against a, a sort of allowing too much to be necessary, too much to constrain God. It seems like we're not being imaginative enough if we're allowing these as um, theodicies, okay? What I mean by that is, well, God maybe, um, uh, chooses, let's say, uh, to inflict some suffering on the person in this world so that he can give him, so he can bestow uh, more reward in the next world. Well, maybe that was his aim, maybe that was his reason, but we'd have to ask, isn't, wasn't it gratuitous? Right? Set aside the first issue we raised, but whether that's uh, just, even if it is absolutely necessary, the question is, how is that necessary? Why couldn't God, if he wanted to, have just been beneficent and given this person extra reward 
without having suffered. Right? There doesn't seem to be any essential connection between the suffering and the extra reward. Right? And the same thing, which is what the Rabbi Shua Fak um, in his Peyo Shua, what he says in response to, uh, to Rashi, the same thing is true, I think, about the view we've just seen in the in Rabbi Yosef Albo, that God could have achieved this aim of making it known to others that this person is truly righteous, even without putting him through this test. I mean, God has many ways, uh, presumably, many means at his disposal through which he could have made this clear to others. So we haven't really given um, a good theodicy um, or even a defense if we haven't explained why this is necessary. What we need is something that bears an essential or necessary connection to the suffering uh, itself. Okay, and that brings us to a number of other versions of the soul-making theodicy. Um, I'll just mention them, in pat I'll mention them quickly without reading them inside in the interest of the time. Rebosif Albo uh, brings another interpretation in which he suggests that uh, the, the, the purpose of Yisurin Shal Ahava, again, it's not a, a punishment if it's Yisurin Shal Ahava, according to this, but the purpose is so that the person who responds in a devoted way, in a loving way to God, even amidst the suffering, is actually manifesting his disposition to follow God in, uh, in the midst of suffering, as opposed to that disposition or tendency remaining latent. And that all by itself, he claims, he argues, and I think it's uh, somewhat plausible, is of value. That is, God wants us to actually be courageous and be altruistic. And when it relates, when it comes to our relationship with God, be devoted. Okay, be devoted in the sense of that devotion actually manifesting itself, rather than just being such, having the disposition that we would be, that we would follow God, even in the midst of suffering. Okay, and that's uh, one answer that really does uh, create an essential tie between the suffering uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the purpose that God is trying to achieve. Maral and others, um, uh, the 16th century um, uh, uh, thinker from Prague, right? Maharal uh, suggests that uh, suffering is in order to detach us from our physical needs, right? If someone is suffering, if someone's suffering physical pain, um, well then, of course, on the one hand, they become very aware of their body, but on the other hand, in a, in a certain way, um, it allows them to detach from, uh, from their body, right? Become much less attached uh, to the body that they have. And this is pretty limited, I think, because we're all aware of suffering that isn't purely bodily suffering or maybe not bodily suffering at all. Right? Many people suffer emotionally and psychologically in ways that have nothing to do with uh, bodily pain. But at any rate, um, that, um, that at least speaks to cases of, uh, of bodily pain. And then what I think is a, a very profound one and um, suggested uh, by an article by Michael Harris, where he develops much at much greater length what he calls a divine intimacy theodicy, right, that the, the purpose of suffering is so that we're intimate with God, sort of a maybe a specification of a soul-making theodicy. Um, uh, and in that vein, Rabbi Soloveitchik, in his book, Out of the Whirlwind, wholly dedicated to the, the issue of uh, evil and suffering, he um, quite profoundly, I think, suggests that uh, sorrow and suffering um, leads inexorably to a feeling of loneliness. Right? There might be cases, I suppose, in which there's communal suffering and then it can maybe bring people together. But very often, maybe usually, uh, suffering makes a person feel lonely, makes them feel like, you know, the, the, the natural question is, why me? Right? It seems like I'm, in a way, alone um, in this suffering. And what Rabbi Soloveitchik claims um, or suggests here at the end is that this, he says, this realization brings to an abrupt end the feeling of togetherness. I stand before God. No one else is beside me. A lonely being meeting the loneliest being in utter seclusion is a traumatic but also a great experience. Okay, he thinks that this is an instance of a, a a revelation, a, a possibility for actual intimacy with the divine. 
Okay, that's a reason to think of this as Yisurin Shoava. It's a way in which love, mutual love between man um, and God um, can, uh, can be consummated. A person can't relate to God and his loneliness until he actually feels the, uh, the loneliness that accompanies suffering, right? At the very least, loneliness itself um, is, uh, is an instance of suffering. And here we have a genuinely essential connection, a logical connection. Right? If, if someone is going to sort of, so sort to of speak, empathize with God and right? understand what it's like to be lonely in that way, uh, he's going to have to be lonely, right? And that all by itself is going to be painful, right? And so that's built in to the, uh, the aim that God has, okay? Now, uh, what is the, uh, what are we to say about this uh, theodicy overall? Well, the main problem is what Hick calls dysteological, dysteleological suffering. That is suffering that doesn't have a teleology because let's say by dint of circumstance or who it is, it's a, let's say a very young child and uh, you know, and no one else is uh, is impacted or can be impacted positively by it. But it seems to be useless. It seems not to serve any purpose of soul making at all in cases like that. Right? And it seems like it couldn't serve any um, purpose of soul making uh, uh, in cases like that. Um, now. Possibly, and, and Hick goes in this direction, you might have to think to broaden our horizons, think beyond this life. Um, and uh, several Jewish thinkers did in fact go in that direction, combining a soul-making theodicy with something like reincarnation, okay, which may sound weird to some of us, uh, but it's, it's a, a view that's um, uh, you know, not, not um, uh, fringe, okay, it, it, it appears in, reappears um, throughout the history of Jewish thought. And Rav Moshe Chaim Mutato takes this position. He combines a soul-making theodicy with reincarnation. So you can't just look at how far someone got um, in, in this life. Right? But even that's only going to take us so far. I mean, cases where it doesn't move the person, the child, forward in the slightest, right? it, it doesn't seem like it matters that there's going to be more opportunity in some other life. That doesn't explain why in the course of this life, there was this suffering, which was completely dystheological, which didn't serve any purpose at all. And this brings us to another kind of theodicy, um, which uh, is a theodicy of the sort that places uh, human beings at the center, right? Says that there's something about them and what God wanted to achieve regarding human beings um, that uh, led him to create a world in which there ends up being suffering. But rather than say that God created a sort of an imperfect world to push human beings in a certain direction, this um, theodicy suggests that God created the world and human beings with some great gift. And it's that gift that could lead in different directions. It could lead to good, but it could also lead to evil. And it, therefore, the, the evil that we see is as a result of human uh, error, uh, not error, human sin, um, and their misuse of the free will that God gave them. Okay, and Eliezer Berkowitz uh, summarizes a, the free will theodicy um, very nicely. He says, man can be frightened, but he cannot be bludgeoned into goodness. If God did not respect man's freedom to choose his course in personal responsibility, not only would the moral good and evil be abolished from the earth, the man himself would go with them. For freedom and responsibility are of the very essence of man. Without them, man is not human. If there is to be man, he must be allowed to make his choices in freedom. And if he has such freedom, he will use it. Using it, he will often use it wrongly. He will decide for the wrong alternative. As he does so, there will be suffering for the innocent. Okay, now, as I said, this is a very famous theodicy, and it's one that someone in the last class asked how I could have given an entire lecture um, and, not, and not mentioned. Okay, this theodicy that's built on two claims, one is an assumption that free will is of uh, immense value, and two, that God can't give creatures uh, free will and at the same time ensure that they're not going to, to misuse it. Okay, now what's remarkable though 
is that it's, it's very late. It comes on the scene, the, the scene of Jewish thought, very late. Okay, Eliezer Berkowitz wasn't the first, Eliezer Berkowitz, 20th century Jewish thinker. Um, he may have been the first, as far as I can tell, who really uh, developed it um, carefully and, and somewhat systematically. Right? He, his precedent is, uh, I'd say, uh, very creative, but um, I think pretty weak, okay? I mean, he, he gives a very nice creative reading of a, a verse in Isaiah. He gives a creative reading in the Talmudic passage in Chagiga, where the Gemara says um, that uh, everything that the Holy One, blessed be he, uh, he created, he created something corresponding to it, based on the verse in uh, Ecclesiastes, um, that according to Rabbi Akiva, that means uh, he created the righteous, therefore he had to create the wicked, which as interpreted by, um, by Berkowitz in light of uh, the beginning of the passage, um, really means that he created the opportunity, the possibility of there being wicked. But if he wanted to create the possibility of the righteous by giving them freedom, he had to also create the possibility of there being wicked people because by giving them freedom, there was that freedom to be wicked, right? But this is, I mean, I, th I think these, it's fair to say this is a slender read. Um, it's not as though uh, the Gemara comes right out and says anything like that. Um, I think the first time you really have anything like a free will theodicy in Jewish thought is in Rabbi Osho Chaim Mutsato. I might be wrong, but as far as I know, um, uh, in the, uh, the 18th century. Um, and we'll, we'll see in a moment how he develops it. But I think um, the, the question is, well, why did it take so long? Why is this theodicy not uh, found much earlier? I mean, the Babylonian Talmud has a bunch of different theodicies, why not this one? Um, and I think I'll, I'll make a number of suggestions. The final suggestion though, will call into question uh, more generally these types of theodicy. I realize we only have three minutes. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to enumerate um, what I think might be the reasons why um, it didn't appear. One is that there, it's actually much more controversial. The assumptions I've mentioned are much more controversial than uh, I made them out to be. Right. Um, the, the assumption that free will is of such immense value is not universally held, uh, and it's not universally held among Jewish thinkers. Okay, here's Nachmanides in Bereshit, who maintains that we were, uh, the world was created, mankind was created without free will, and will eventually revert back to that Edenic state of not having free will, because that's really the ideal. We only got free will when we ate um, from the tree of knowledge, and he says explicitly that the granting of free will, the receiving a free will, on the one hand, it's a godlike attribute, but as far as man is concerned, it is bad because through it, he has a will and desire, right? It's not obvious that freedom per se is good if it's freedom that can and will be used for uh, bad things. It's also controversial that it's not possible to give man freedom and for God to ensure that uh, things will go well. Throughout the history of philosophy, um, a position known as compatibilism has been, I think, the dominant one, maybe up until the last half century. But um, throughout much of the uh, prior 300 years, the position that says that determinism is fully compatible with free will is actually the dominant position. And even among Jewish thinkers, uh, you certainly find defenses of that. Some think Maimonides held that, although I, I don't think so. But um, uh, you can certainly find that among Jewish thinkers. If that's true, if compatibilism is true, then again, we don't really have a good theodicy because God could have achieved the great good of freedom and still ensured that things, um, things would go right. Um, another suggestion, uh, would be that uh, sort of God took too much of a risk. Right? Here's like a dilemma. Either God knew what the free, cre free creatures he cre was creating would do, or he didn't. If he did, then it seems like he could have just picked the creatures uh, who were going to only do good things. And if he didn't, it seems like he was taking too much of a risk. Right? He was taking a very big risk. Uh, they could have done and ended up doing truly atrocious things. Now here, there's what to talk about because it could very well be that the value of free will is found not only in freely chosen 
uh, freely made good choices, but maybe even, well, in the very possession of freedom, that's how Mayor Simcha of Dvinsk seems to think, but also maybe even in the, the free bad choices. And here's where we, we find Rabbi Shechayim Lutzato giving something of a theodicy. Uh, I recognize we're out of time. I, just, I will wrap this up in um, one minute. Okay, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato's theodicy is that God um, gives man freedom because his ultimate aim is to reveal his unity in the world. And so he wants uh, uh, it to be the case that either man follows God's will, in which way it shows that God's will is manifest, or if they violate God's will, they disobey, that God ultimately defeats that. And thereby, again, um, God's unity is manifest in the universe. And now in this way of seeing things, free bad choices maybe aren't equally valuable, but they're also of value, even if it's only incremental value, okay? And so maybe that addresses that, that concern, okay? Now, the biggest problem is the limitation on the free will theodicy, because well, there are all sorts of things like earthquakes and hurricanes that don't seem to be the product of, um, of human action. So here, uh, usually the, the free will theodicy is supplemented with a natural law theodicy. The idea is we couldn't really be free if we couldn't predict where our actions would lead, right? What, what would happen if we tried to stand up? So you need laws of nature. And laws of nature, if they take their course, they can also create evils. And this is something you do find in Talmudic sources, in Moe Katan and Abu Zarah. Okay, I'm gonna skip those. So maybe all of those problems can be dealt with, but why, what is the real problem, I think, and the real reason that it, it makes such a late appearance and it's not um, such a prominent theodicy is that I think there's a more general tension in theodicies of greatness, as I've been calling them, which include the soul-making theodicy and the free will theodicy, which is that by their very nature, they have to assume that there's something extremely valuable and important about human beings. They play a central role uh, in the cosmos, and if you think that, you presumably think that about each and every individual human being. But then also by their very nature, they take this global perspective where they think, okay, you know, maybe we have to sacrifice a person here, a thousand people there, a million people there in order to achieve this great aim. But no one who placed a premium, placed tremendous value on each and every individual human being could possibly reason just like that, right? only in that global way. They would have to reason on an individual level. That is what Marilyn Adams claims, and you can read it at, uh, at your leisure here. Um, it's the last source, but I think it's also what's alluded to in the Midrash, which I'll finish. The Midrash in Shemot uh, Rabbah says, V'hatzel lo hitalta et amecha. You have not saved your nation. This is Moses after uh, you know, going to, to Pharaoh, and as a result, um, things are only made worse. The, the verse uses the word v'hatzel, saved, twice. So how are we to understand that Rabbi Shmael, Omer, Rabbi Shmael says, v'hatzel as, as usual, Rabbi Shmael doesn't make much of this, and says, it just means certainty, right? Verily, it is evident that uh, you haven't saved. Rabbi Kiva makes, some, makes a lot of the double usage. He says, I know you're going to save them. Right, but what about those who have been immured in the buildings, who are stuck in there, will never get out? You may have a grand plan, God, Moses says, right? And maybe it's a justified one. But what about the individuals right, who don't make it? in that grand plan, right? The individuals who ultimately suffer because of this larger picture. That's just not something Rabbi Kiva says that Moses was uh, was willing to countenance, okay? And the Midrash goes on to say that the, uh, the attribute of justice was going to strike Moses, but God saw that he was only arguing that because of Israel, and so he spared him. But this attitude, this response is I think maybe the Achilles heel. It's a genuine problem with the odysseys of greatness um, more generally. Okay, I don't know if that's why it made such a late appearance uh, and, and sort of infrequent, um, but I think it's a, a real issue. Um, and uh, maybe, well, you know, that's going to lead us to the, the Theodicy's next week, 
which are not theodicies of greatness, they're theodicies of smallness. They don't um, assume to begin with that man has this uh, utterly central role in the cosmos, and therefore they're not uh, um, open to the same sort of criticism. I apologize for going over uh, four minutes. Um, and I'm, I'm around now if anyone wants to ask any questions. I do see again uh, that there are a bunch in the chat. Uh, it's gonna be again, a little hard for me to know what was, uh, each one was. Yeah, hi, I think that's uh, an excellent point. It seems kind of self-centered to say that people have to suffer from my um, moral development, right? I mean, there's something uh, distasteful to put it uh, mildly, right, about that idea. Um, and I think that um, maybe was what I was getting at uh, at the end. Um, okay, yeah, anyone can uh, feel free to unmute, ask questions. Uh, I'm happy to stick around. Uh, Thank you very much. Okay, it looks like no questions, correct? Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, so good to see familiar faces and new place, uh, faces. And thank you, uh, Dr. Siegel, for an interesting uh, second class for this session. I'm looking forward to uh, next Monday. And thanks uh, also to the, uh, the people who viewed us uh, live on Facebook and Andresha Live. Uh, we continue our spring program tomorrow at 8 p.m. with the second class in a series on death and the afterlife in the rabbinic and Kabbalistic imagination with Dr. Nathaniel Berman and Rabbi David uh, Silver. So hope to see you uh, there as well. And as always, we have many more classes happening, so you can find out more information as well as the registration links on our website at www.drisha.org slash classes. You can also watch recordings of the classes. I posted uh, the recording uh, in the chat, but it's, um, I mean, I'm sorry, I posted the website in the chat. It's uh, www.drisha.org uh, slash live. Thank you again for this opportunity to learn with you, uh, Dr. Siegel, and thanks again to everyone who attended. I really hope to see you soon in one of our upcoming classes here at Drisha.